The first Toy Story was released in 1995 in the United States and 1996 here in Sweden. I was three years old at the time and I'm pretty sure I didn't see it in theaters. I mostly say that because I've always cited my earliest movie going experience being going to see Hjälp jag är en fisk with my mom which was released in 2000 when I was six years old. A movie that, by the way, I've never rewatched or ever heard anyone else mention, so uh, perhaps I conjured that movie into existence and it isn't real. After my parents' divorce, a very untraumatic and honestly trivial event for me, mostly mentioned here for the sake of contextualizing and painting something of an image of who and where I were at the time, I remember repeatedly watching my VHS copy of Toy Story on the TV in the upstairs common room of the Radhus where I lived with my dad at the time. I remember crying as the rotating vertical crane shot pulled us away from Buzz, his arm detached from his body, as Mikael Rupe seemingly channeled Buzz's inner monologue by saying that he ska aldrig flyga igen. A very rare instance of a Swedish interpretation of a song from an animated kids film being arguably more gut-wrenching than Randy Newman's original. I remember kinda wanting a Woody, a Buzz, a Potato Head or even Slinky Dog, but most of all wanting a Babyface, Legs and Ducky. I remember sitting on the floor of that same common room, in reality just a small space outside of the two bedrooms with just enough space for a CRT TV, two armchairs, some toys in a box and an ADHD ridden kid with a god complex, having seemingly learned nothing from the film as I cut the tail of a brontosaurus and duct taped a plastic screwdriver to the stump after having already replaced its head with the head of a cyberpunk looking knight in black armor that I had disassembled minutes earlier. Skipping ahead to what I assume must be around 2000-2001, I remember sitting in my mom's bottom floor duplex apartment where a couch for some inexplicable reason covered one of the door frames, watching Toy Story 2 for the umpteenth time while eating white untoasted bread with cheese and the crusts cut off. I remember that one scene, the one that everyone likes to describe now as being so satisfying on social media. I remember the drawer of eyeballs and the way that the brush left streaks of paint on the underside of Woody's shoe as Andy's name was erased from it. I remember renting Toy Story 3 from Ika Wiesborg through one of those touchscreen machines that spit out the DVD in a thin plastic casing in 2011. I was 17 years old and had moved out of my dad's place about six months earlier, now living with my best friend at a time and a newfound acquaintance unofficially living on our couch. I remember walking home from the store with the DVD in the grocery bag together with a discounted loaf of bread. I distinctly remember this discounted loaf of bread because we often did this. Bought discounted loaves of bread that expired that same day, took it home, sliced it, ran it in the oven for 15 minutes and ate it with copious amounts of butter for dinner, breakfast and lunch. 20 crowns could last me 3 days back then. I remember a vague plan of smoking weed and watching it, but the weed never materialized, which was probably for the better, as I distinctly remember the three of us sitting wordlessly as the final scene played out. Two of us silently crying, one of us just staring out the window. Now I'm sharing all of this for two reasons. Uh, the first one being to emphasize how this franchise has been with me throughout my life. These were just a few examples of moments that stick out to me now in retrospect. But it doesn't begin to scratch the surface of the figurative mountain that are the collected Toy Story related memories that I carry with me. For example, I haven't mentioned playing Buzz Lightyear of Star Command at a neighbor's house in 2001, or watching Buzz Lightyear of Star Command The Adventure Begins on VHS in my mom's apartment after she moved to Stockholm or playing the PC port of the 1996 Sega Mega Drive, that's Genesis for you Americans, game Toy Story on my dad's first computer somewhere around 1999, or playing Toy Story 2 Buzz Lightyear to the rescue on my PC on the first night in my new room in a new town before starting a new school after my dad and I moved 
in 2004. The second reason I'm sharing all of this is to hopefully overload you with sentimental and subjectively important memories of a beloved pop culture franchise of my childhood that I hold very dearly and then be able to say that despite the importance that those memories have held and continue to hold to me, I didn't feel the slightest sting of worry when Toy Story 4 was announced. Not because I was sure that it'd be good, in fact I was pretty sure it wouldn't be. After Toy Story 3, I, and every other sensible person in this universe, had a hard time seeing how they could continue the franchise after how the third one ended. I also wasn't faced when I read that it wouldn't be focusing as much on Buzz as the previous films, instead opting to give room to Bo Peep in what has otherwise been a decently dude-focused franchise. I wasn't even bothered when I saw promotional material of Forky being a goofy little guy, or when the reviews started coming in with less than favorable scores. Why? Because I really do not vibe with the strong distaste of remakes, sequels, prequels and spin-off that permeates large parts of online culture. I especially don't vibe with the whole things were better back in the day, coincidentally around the specific time that I was growing up in sentiment that essentially weaponizes the sense of nostalgia that you may feel for something against its very creators, attempting to give a new generation of kids those same feelings, while also treating the old guard to a new adventure with their childhood favorite characters. I say all of this because if I really need to break it down, it's okay for a movie to suck, even if it's an installment in a franchise that you love. Because regardless of the amount of suckage on display from this new entry, I assure you the original hasn't gone anywhere. You can go back and watch it as many times as you want. Projecting your adult cynicism on a kid's movie is not only a nonsensical waste of your time, but also a great disservice to kids that might love the product in question. Because newsflash, the seven-year-olds of today are just as old as you were when you were seven. So that was about three whole pages of Arial size 12 text of me saying, essentially, I grew up with Toy Story as well, but you don't see me whining about Toy Story 4. But if you've stayed with me this far, I think that means that not only are you willing to put up with my voice, accent and half-assed writing and hair, you're also ready or even excited to hear me completely contradict myself as I tell you exactly why Toy Story 4 really fucking bothers me. Because it really does. But that being said, Toy Story 4 really fucking bothers me is mostly a decent YouTube title and it doesn't necessarily encapture exactly what I want to get across in this video. It did start that way, in fact I did write down the exact words Toy Story 4 really fucking bothers me in the notes app on my phone where I keep my video ideas just minutes after the end credits of Toy Story 4 had rolled down my screen. or rather my wall here, because I was watching it on the projector here in my apartment. But in my pursuit of realizing this idea, the why Toy Story 4 really fucking bothers me experience, I kept falling into these potholes, these different directions of what I wanted to include in this video. Some of them ended up in it and you'll see them and some of them will never see the light of day. But So for those who didn't click off the video during that lengthy intro bit where I kept meandering on about various Toy Story related memories uh, of my life and, uh, and you've instead stuck around all the way until now despite me not having even begun to talk about what it is that I don't like or do like for that matter in Toy Story 4 or any of the other installments of the franchise, I have another title for you. It's not as clickable, it's not as snappy, uh, but it is more factually correct and it's an exclusive title that only the strong-willed of us will get to hear. Those who stuck around until this point. It's kind of like a secret club and if you're seeing this without having skipped to this part, you're now a member. So. Uh, 
With no further ado, welcome to Mustached Man Speaks of the Toy Story franchise for an unreasonable amount of time, attempting to make sense of his own thoughts, sharing Mad Libs style free association esque observations with no guarantee of reaching any kind of satisfying conclusion. I hope that this new title set your expectations correctly and that you feel ready to proceed. First and foremost, I think that to fully understand why Toy Story 4 bothers me, one needs to have the first three installments fresh in memory, and also probably an idea of how I specifically perceive them and what message uh, they're trying to convey. Uh, so therefore, I think that the best plan of action here is to begin this journey by recapping the uh, story of Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I'll try to keep it short, but uh, I will also take the time that it needs to take, as I deem it necessary, to lay this groundwork up front. I have attempted to condense these recaps down to basically a brief story summary followed by what I like to refer to as musings on what I perceive to be uh, the general themes uh, and some observations about the characters, their goals and any other stuff that I feel is worth mentioning. Also, please note that brief story summary means that I will be skipping over some plot points and details. So if you're sitting there thinking that uh, I'm missing some very vital piece, uh, I've probably dropped it in the interest of time, but please feel free to drop it in the comments, I'd love to read it. So, Woody is a toy, specifically he's a 1950s cowboy toy, and he is also his owner Andy's absolute favorite toy. In this universe, which we will be discussing in more detail later, when humans are not around, toys come alive, and they have an emotional depth that is seemingly comparable to humans. Being Andy's favorite toy means that Woody is a sort of leader over the group of toys that Andy own, a role that for the time being puts Woody under a lot of pressure as Andy's family is about to move to a new house, an understandably stressful time for a toy. To mention a few of the main gang characters, we have Rex, Mr. Potato Head, Slinky Dog, Ham, Bo Peep, and as introduced in the first act of the film, Buzz Lightyear. On Andy's birthday, he receives the coolest new toy, a Buzz Lightyear action figure. Buzz isn't aware that he is a toy, and instead believes that he is an actual space ranger from the planet of Morph, defending the Galactic Alliance as part of the Universe Protection Unit against the evil Emperor Zerg and his minions. As Buzz is slowly being integrated into this ragtag group, Woody's jealousy grows stronger. Both because the other toys are now seemingly more impressed by Buzz than they are with Woody. Uh, but more importantly, Buzz seems to be Andy's new favorite as well, essentially replacing Woody and threatening his position as a leader of the group. A couple of days before the move, Andy is going to Pizza Planet, which is a sort of combination between an arcade and a pizza place. Sort of like Chuck E. Cheese, I think, but I wouldn't know. I've never been to one. Andy is allowed to only bring one toy, and in an attempt to get Buzz stuck behind the shelf so that Woody will be the one that gets to go with Andy, Woody accidentally knocks Buzz out of the window. The other toys accuse Woody of cold-blooded murder, and soon, after not being able to find Buzz, Andy brings Woody with him instead. Buzz, however, climbs inside the car, and when it stops at a gas station, a fight breaks out, and they are left behind as Andy's mother drive off with the car. They hitch a ride to Pizza Planet, manage to sneak inside and find Andy. However, Buzz gets distracted by something that he construes as a functioning spaceship to take him home, and they end up inside a claw machine. Here, they get picked up by Andy's neighbor kid, Sid. Sid was established earlier as something of a scientist who tortures, tortures toys, toys just for just fun. For they end up at Sid's place, where he intends to conduct his little experiments on the two of them. I don't believe that man's ever been to medical school. Here, Buzz catches a TV ad for himself, and this makes him realize that he is, in fact, a toy, but not after one last attempt of proving he is who he thinks he is that ends with his arm breaking off. Buzz then enters a state of psychosis for a short while, believing himself to be Mrs. Nesbitt, after Sid's little sister appropriates the spaceman into her tea time play session. Buzz then goes from delusional to depressed. 
All hope seems lost as Woody also starts giving up on the idea of them getting out of there alive. But something he says to Buzz makes Buzz realize that they need to get out. They devise a plan together with Sid's mutant toys to break the rules and teach Sid a lesson. As Sid is about to shoot Buzz into space, the toys inflict some irreparable trauma and they manage to escape. However, the move has already begun and the moving truck is now driving away. They chase the car, ends up using Sid's rocket and Buzz flies them for the last little bit and all is good. In the new house we find that it's now Christmas and the toys are awaiting if any new toys will be joining them. We learn that Woody and Buzz are now friends and that Andy is getting a new puppy. The end. Toy Story 1, and in fact the entire franchise, as far as I'm concerned, thematically centers around the concept of fear of abandonment. In this first installment, Woody feels threatened by Buzz's presence and is worried that Buzz will replace him. Toys in general, and Woody especially, seem to exist for a single purpose, to make a kid happy. This is clearly exemplified early on in the movie when Woody says, it doesn't matter how much we get played with, what matters is that we're here for Andy when he needs us. That's what we're made for, right? As Andy's mom drives away, and somewhere around the middle of the film, uh, leaving Woody and Buzz at the gas station, Woody immediately breaks down with the words, I'm a lost toy. This is seemingly the worst fate for a toy, something that the sequels, and especially Toy Story 4, will explore further. However, by the end of this film, uh, we find that through the trials and tribulations of the film, Woody has learned that there is room for more than one on the top. He has learned that you won't necessarily be replaced just because a new shiny thing or person comes around. They fill their own purpose, have their own value, one that is likely very different from yours. It is a Pixar film after all, so to say that Toy Story wants you to feel that your uniqueness is your biggest strength doesn't feel very far-fetched, given their track record and general uh, themes in their movies. Just like how a mother continues to love their first child despite a new baby being on the way, Andy hasn't stopped loving Woody in favor of Buzz and Woody at the end of the film knows this. In terms of character arc, Woody starts off as a seemingly confident leader. He then either progresses into or just shows his true colors I guess as a deeply insecure and jealous person. And in the end, like previously mentioned, he has regained a sense of uh, calm. Buzz's character arc is somewhat similar, starting off confident and believing himself to be the main character. He is, after all, THE Buzz Lightyear. But the difference lies in the fact that while Woody knows what he wants, but his fear is not getting it, Buzz instead, upon realizing that he is in fact a mass-produced made in Taiwan toy, loses all sense of purpose. He knows no longer what it is that he wants. He learns, however, that just because what you thought to be your purpose turns out to be fruitless, unachievable or just plain incorrect, that doesn't mean that there are no other goals that one can strive to achieve. The path to happiness is seldom a straight road and for Buzz, his purpose gets reignited from hearing Woody's passionate words about Andy and the purpose of a toy. By the end of the movie, we also get a glimpse of Buzz displaying the same emotions that Woody did at the beginning of the film, uh, showing obvious signs of nervousness over what toy might be joining them and possibly, at least in his mind, replace him. I guess in summary, these toys are, for a lack of better words, very human. Woody and Buzz are now leading the group as a duo, further solidifying what the ending of Toy Story 1 made us suspect. They are now not only friends, but best friends. Andy is about to go away for a cowboy camp, but before leaving he accidentally creates a rip in the seams of Woody's arm, therefore deciding to leave him at home as to not cause him any further damage. This, once again, throws Woody off, and he has nightmares about being thrown away and forgotten by Andy. He gets placed on a shelf where he discovers Wheezy, a forgotten toy. Soon after this it's time for a yard sale and when Andy's mom is collecting things to put up for sale, Wheezy is among them. Woody goes on a rescue mission together with the dog, whose name I forget at this moment, and they manage to rescue Wheezy, but Woody ends up on the table himself. A man comes up, gets absolutely flabbergasted by his find and offers to buy Woody. 
Andy's mom, knowing how much Andy likes Woody, refuses to sell him. This doesn't stop the man from stealing him though. The man is Al of Al's Toy Barn, the store that ran the ad for the Buzz Lightyear action figure in the first film. We learn that Al is a toy collector, looking to complete his set of merchandise from an obscure 1950s TV show called Woody's Roundup. He has every other piece of the collection, yo-yos, vinyl records, lampshades and lunchboxes but also the others of the show's main cast, Jesse, Bullseye, and The Prospector, also known as Stinky Pete. Woody being the rarest toy and now having joined them, they are now a complete set, and Al will be selling them to a museum in Tokyo, Japan. Woody, however, is horrified by the idea of leaving Andy, and he attempts to escape. He doesn't succeed, but instead he learns of just how much an icon he is. This possibly plays into his need to always be the center of attention as established in the first film. But is this need bigger than his love for Andy? While he wrestles this dilemma, he talks to Jessie and finds out that she once had an owner as well. She explains how eventually owners give up their toys. She was left by her owner, Emily, and she never got over it. Quote, you, you never, never forget, forget kids, kids like, like Emily, Emily or, or Andy, Andy, but they forget you. Woody empathizes with this, especially after being put on the shelf at the beginning of the film. Swaying Woody even further is the prospector, saying, quote, Andy is growing up. You think he's going to take you to college or on his honeymoon? Woody's anxieties and insecurities gets to him, and he deems the risk of getting abandoned by Andy as a very real threat, and therefore decides to stick around with the Roundup gang and go with them to Tokyo. Quote, who am I to break up the Roundup gang? A quote that, as far as I'm concerned, shows that while Woody's decision goes against what has been established as his purpose in life, i.e. being there for Andy and making him happy, quote again, being there for Andy, that's what it's all about, right? It is a decision that despite being fueled by insecurity is something that Woody can morally defend as being the right thing to do. And this speaks volumes as to who Woody is as far as I'm concerned. I keep adding that in, but... This is very subjective. Woody is a flawed and insecure person, but who among us can say that we aren't? And he always tries to do what's best for the group, or at least that's what he believes he is doing, and that's how he rationalizes his decisions. Woody's original group was starting to show wear and tear, splitting apart at the seams, if you will. And presented with this opportunity to be appreciated forever, it's easy to see that as long as no reminders of Andy and his old groups are present, this new opportunity would come off as the best possible outcome for Woody, while simultaneously doing what is right for the group. Sorry though, I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself and entering uh, analysis territory here a little bit, so uh, let's continue the story. Unbeknownst to Woody's decision, Buzz, Slinky Dog, Mr. Potato Head, Rex and Ham are on a rescue mission to get Woody back home. They manage to make their way to Al's toy barn, where a mix-up happens in that a new version of Buzz, now with a new utility belt, gets out of his box and our Buzz gets put inside the box. For simplicity's sake, I am going to refer to them as Belt Bus and Original Bus from here on out. Belt Bus, much like Real Bus in the first film, believes he is a real space ranger out to stop the evil Emperor Zerg. He meets up with the rest of the gang who mistakes him for Real Bus. They keep going for Al's apartment and Real Bus gets out of the box and starts following them closely behind. During this, Real Bus accidentally releases a Zerg. They all make it to Al's apartment but are shocked to find that Woody has decided to abandon Andy. You are not Woody, a, collector's not a collector's item. item. You a are a child's plaything. Play you, you are a, a toy, Buzz says to Woody, mirroring Woody's statements to Buzz in the first film while trying to convince Buzz that he is in fact a toy. For how much longer? One, One more, more rip, rip and Andy's done with, done, done with me, Woody retorts. Somewhere in that pad of stuffing is a toy Somewhere who taught me that life's only, only worth living if you're being loved by a kid. And I, I traveled all, all this way to rescue, rescue that toy because I believed him. Buzz then answers. As Buzz and the other toys leave, Buzz turns to Woody and says, Watch kids from behind glass and never be loved again? Some life. Buzz's disappointment in his friend is palpable as he leaves with the rest. Woody has a moment of realization. It isn't until now, when he definitively made the choice, that he realizes the consequences of his actions, and what effect this will really have on himself, his friends, and Andy. He now knows that he has made the wrong decision, and decides he must follow his friends back home. What am I doing? Quote, 
You're right. I can't stop Andy from growing up, but I wouldn't miss it for the world. He convinces Jesse and Bullseye to come along, but Stinky Pete, the prospector, has other ideas. I didn't quite touch on this before, but Pete has never been played with. In fact, he is mint in box. He has never been outside of it. That is, until now, when he locks the vent to stop Woody from leaving. Al then returns and packs the toys up to take them to Japan. Belt Buzz hangs back to catch up with Serg, who we have now learned is Buzz's father, in what I think might have been the first case ever of me understanding a pop culture reference inside of another piece of pop culture as a kid. The gang goes to the airport, manages to save Woody, Jesse and Balsai and get back to Andy's place before he is back from camp. In the closing sequence of the film, we have one of my favorite pieces of dialogue in the entire franchise. Are you still worried? You still worried? About, About Andy? Andy? No. It'll be, It'll be fun while it lasts. I'm proud, I'm proud of you, cowboy. cowboy. Besides, and besides, when it all ends, I'll have old Buzz Lightyear to keep me company, for infinity and beyond. Further driving home just why Woody decided to not go to Japan. He'd rather live his dream until it's impossible than to make the safe choice and always wonder. It's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. Let's hope that nothing comes along in the future to fuck that up. So how to unpack Toy Story 2 in just a few sentences. Um, here's my shot. For me, this film centers around, you guessed it, the fear of abandonment. But instead of being fueled by jealousy, this time the main source of the abandonment is to be forgotten. To fade away rather than to burn out. We have Woody that goes through a similar arc as in the first film, but now fearing the prospect of Andy simply outgrowing him, something which will be even further explored in Toy Story 3. Then we have Jesse, who is revealed to have lived through the trauma it is for a toy to be abandoned, now cynical and untrusting, but deep down just confused and heartbroken having never been able to understand why her owner Emily did what she did to her. As the film goes on, however, and as we reach the end, we essentially get to witness Jessie confront her fears and learn to love, or better yet, learn to be loved again. It's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. This also rings true for the prospector, who unfortunately has never loved and hence never lost that love. This has turned him into a bitter, self-loathing, kid-hating dickbag Quote, you idiots, children destroy toys, you'll all be ruined, forgotten, spending eternity rotting in some landfill. But the most interesting aspect of the prospector is that, well, he isn't wrong, is he? Kids do stop playing with their toys, and most if not all toys do end up in the landfill eventually. Kids do destroy toys, get sick of them, abandon them, throw them away, forget about them. But this theme is explored much further in... Andy is about to leave for college. Many of the toys that we have seen in the other films have left over the years in one way or another, including Bo Peep, Woody's love interest. More about her in about one recap and an intermission. When cleaning out his room, Andy puts all of the main gang toys into a bag to store away in the attic. Except for Woody, who he intends to bring to college like an absolute little weirdo. Andy's mom mistakes the bag for trash and takes it outside. The toys manage to avoid the garbage truck and sneak inside a donation box, heading for the Sunnyside daycare. And Woody comes along while trying to convince the others that Andy did not mean to throw them away. At Sunnyside, they meet the leader of the daycare, Lotso Hugging Bear, or Lotso for short. The group is delighted to learn from Lotso that the daycare never runs out of kids. The toys there gets played with every day, and when the kids grow older, new kids arrive and take their place. This truly is a utopia for toys. Woody leaves determined to be there for Andy and come with him to college. He, however, gets picked up by a little girl named Bonnie. At Bonnie's house, Woody gets played with shortly and gets introduced to her other toys. Upon learning that he escaped from Sunnyside, they are shocked, and from them Woody learns the true nature of Sunnyside. Meanwhile, back at Sunnyside, we see that the main group has had their first day with kids. Toddlers. It's rough. When requesting to be transferred to a section with a more age-appropriate group of kids, Lotso's and Sunnyside's true colors show themselves. This isn't a utopia, but in fact a fascist dictatorship. 
Lotso's goons kidnap Buzz and switch him back to demo mode, essentially brainwashing him to become one of Lotso's goons himself. The group then realizes that Woody was telling the truth of Andy not trying to throw them out, and they try to go back home. But the now brainwashed Buzz captures and imprisons them. Woody comes back to rescue his friends, and they attempt to escape through a trash chute. Trash, trash chute. Trash chute. I can't say that. They escape through that anyway. They also try to reset Buzz, but he turns Spanish, don't worry about it. A confrontation with Lotso happens, and they manage to kind of shake the group morale at Sunnyside, and the other toys question Lotso, but it ends with them falling into the dumpster anyway, along with Lotso. At the dump, the green little men run off for a huge claw, and also uh, Buzz is back to being himself now, that happened on the way there. They rescue Lotso from being shredded despite his evilness. They end up on a conveyor belt heading for an incinerator. On their way there, they help Lotso off the belt to get to an emergency stop button, where he promptly leaves them all to die. What follows is, without a question, one of the most insane scenes I have ever witnessed in an animated kids film. The toys are all slowly getting sucked into the fiery pits of hell, and they desperately try to find a way out, until they just stop. They reach for each other's hands, and one by one, we get to look into the eyes of our childhood heroes as each of them in their own subtle way accept that this is the end of the line. Death is inevitable, and resistance is futile. Death has reared its ugly head, and all hope is not only lost, but sent to the lost and found department, incorrectly filed, placed on a shelf, knocked down behind it, and then somehow no-clipped inside the wall, where it now resides for infinity and beyond. They have accepted their mortality. They have stopped fighting. And then they get rescued by a huge claw, the green men did their thing, because of course they did, but whatever, that's an insane scene. That It's fucking bonkers. Lotso ends up on a garbage truck, and the gang makes it back to Andy's house. Here, Woody leaves a note to Andy, who thinks that the note is from his mother, asking him to donate the toys. But not to Sunnyside. To Bonnie. In one of the film's final scenes, we see Andy approach Bonnie with a box, and introduce her to all the toys one by one. Ending with Woody, that he first hesitates to give up, but finally decides to include. After this, we get something of an epilogue, where we learn what a great place Sunnyside has turned into now, through letter correspondence between the Sunnyside toys and Bonnie's group. And so that's Toy Story 3, and the finale to the Toy Story trilogy. This is where a lot of people agree that it should have ended, and I'm inclined to agree, as you probably know by now. It's a perfect send-off for all the characters, it leaves us at a point that pretty brilliantly combines optimism and realism. Essentially, we learn that, yes, things will change. Yes, you might or even definitely will be replaced or forgotten in time. However, that is not the end. So, does this movie not carry the implication that Bonnie will one day do exactly what Andy did, i.e. grow out of her toys and leave them behind? And yes, of course, it does. But what Toy Story 3 does so brilliantly, if you ask me, and what makes it feel like a more mature take on the core dilemma of the Toy Story universe than in the previous installments, is that it finally walks the line between not shying away from those questions while also not expanding too much on the universe as to not encourage the audience to overanalyze the aspects of toy mortality and the eternal suffering of toys. More on those implications in the upcoming little 
intermission that I've got planned. Another aspect of Toy Story 3 that I think is worth mentioning is how heavy-handedly it wears one of its thematic cores on its sleeve. That being, we will overcome as long as we are together. I'm not going to list every quote, but here are a few examples of times where this sentiment is essentially explicitly spoken by a character. Whatever happens, at least we'll all be together. From now on, we stick together. Woody, what do we do? We'll be okay if we stay together. Thank you, Sheriff. We're all in this together. This notion is very central in the previous installments as well, and it makes sense that as the stakes grow higher, uh, the notion of the character's motivations also grow clearer. We haven't spoken much about the villains and their motivations, but Lotso in this one and the Prospector in the second one share a few key elements. The Prospector saw other toys fly off the shelf while he got left behind. This theme will also be explored further in Toy Story 4 with Gabby Gabby. The Prospector is left hurt and essentially grows resentful. Lotso, on the other hand, has experienced having an owner and being loved, but upon seeing himself be replaced by his owner, he as well grows resentful of kids. He reads this replacement of himself as being done with malicious intent, when it in fact could and probably should be read as an indication of the love that his owner felt for him. She needed him, and when he was suddenly not around due to circumstances outside of her control, she needed a replacement. If you'll allow me, I'm gonna go on a quick little tangent here. I promise it's related. So to reiterate, Lotso got replaced due to necessity. He got lost. Not due to cruelty on his owner's part. She needed Lotso and Lotso needed her. But when Lotso was no longer around for her, she needed to fill that Lotso-shaped hole in her heart with something that only another Lotso could fill. This makes me think of romantic relationships and how they might come to an end. That's an event that is sometimes followed by you having to watch your former life mate meet someone new through social media or otherwise. You might even take note of how your ex's new partner reminds you of you. And you may either judge your ex for that, or hate the new partner for how they are essentially a replacement of you. Possibly a perceived upgrade, possibly a downgrade. Depending on how you as a person view your ex, their new partner, and probably most importantly yourself. But they may also be nothing like you, and you might come to the realization that the hole in your former lover's heart never had a U-shape in the first place. Or perhaps it did and it still does, and it's rather a matter of you not fitting into the previously U-shaped hole. Perhaps the fact that you are a constantly growing and changing person slowly shaped you into a bad fit for the hole after a while. Perhaps you attempted to adapt, allowing your body and features to be contorted to fit the mold that used to house you so perfectly until it simply wasn't feasible to do so anymore. Maybe the reason you were quote-unquote replaced was due to the fact that you changed, not your partner. And that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Growth is change, and change isn't bad, but change can disrupt compatibility. That was my quick tangent, thank you for listening. Now, let's move on from Toy Story 3 to Toy Story 4, right after this short intermission. Hello, and welcome to the intermission part of this video. Uh, I looked at the script, which is currently at 19 pages at the time of writing this sentence, and I realized that it will be quite an endeavor to sit through this whole thing, so therefore I included this short little intermission, inspired by the absolute master of long-form media analysis content, Tim Rogers of Action Button. You've made it this far, so good job. Uh, assuming that you've been watching this at one time speed, you've watched this video for this long, and you have this long to go. And that means that you are 48.89% into the video. This is a great point to stretch your legs, take a break, have a glass of water, maybe a good night's sleep, and then come back. Perhaps not what I should be encouraging, seeing how YouTube is all about retention and maintaining your audience throughout the video, but I guess I'm just a little quirky like that. As I'm recording this, I'm in the middle of editing, I just gave myself a haircut in the bathroom because looking at myself for this prolonged period of time, I realized that I look like an absolute dirtbag. But for this intermission, I'm gonna be talking about the world of Toy Story, the implications of the universe, and also just how easy it is to make fun of it. 
Whenever I brought up to anyone that I intended to do a video on Toy Story 4, be it any of my friends, my girlfriend or my cat, they'd all say some variation of one of these three things. Number one. So what's the deal with the toy's awareness? Some toys can talk, some can't, some objects like the Magic 8 Ball isn't alive, but isn't that also a toy? Like, how is Forky alive in Toy Story 4? Just through the sheer will of Bonnie? Number 2. Can the toys die? And what about age? Like, they seem to learn, but they don't grow older. Isn't it weird how they, like, embrace their deaths in Toy Story 3 before they think they're gonna be burned at a dump? But in Toy Story 4, we see a toy get completely torn apart by a cat, and later, that same toy is just, like, chilling at a party, like, guts hanging outside the body. The same goes for Sid's toys. What about them? Like, they're all conscious and aware, despite being freakish amalgamations of the various toys that Sid's managed to get his grubby little fingers on. How does that work? And number three. decent impersonation, honestly. And these are all valid thoughts and questions to have, and while watching through the four films with my girlfriend, we did, in fact, question many of these same things. Like, for example, the whole side plot in Toy Story 3, with the monkey being in charge of the security camera, so they do have security cameras there? Do they just never look at the footage? Because surely, if they ever did, they would catch like, I don't know, a hundred toys just kind of fully autonomously walking around, talking, being up to various like mischief. And sure, one could argue that perhaps the daycare workers rarely check their camera feed or that the monkey is in charge of also erasing that footage or quickly loading up Adobe After Effects, animating a mask path and using content-aware fill on all the footage to erase all traces of conscious toys. But even if he did, this is just one daycare and one group of toys. like. Aren't all toys alive? Everywhere? I guess they're not, because when they're in the toy store and it's like the Buzz Lightyear aisle, uh, all of the Buzz Lightyears are just in their box. But like the Barbie dolls, they're alive. They're like dancing, having a party when the guys come there. Also, why is it only the Buzz Lightyear universe uh, of toys that don't understand that they're toys? Like Belt Buzz has the exact same delusions as original Buzz, and so does Zerg. Uh, but every other toy, they just seem to be completely aware that they're a toy. As you can see, it's easy to get uh, sidetracked here, but the point is that while watching through these films, I had those same comments and I'd say it's almost impossible as an adult to not wonder about these things. And in fact, I remember pondering on similar questions as a kid as well, so it's probably not like an age thing and probably more uh, inherent to when you have a universe like this, uh, i.e. a universe that uh, is kind of based on the question, what if thing? was alive. Because then the audience will most likely ask the question, yeah, what if thing was alive? However, while these types of musings can be entertaining, I also think that they have a time and a place, and I don't think they add much value to a video, like this one at least, uh, other than being like an easy way to get some jokes in here. And listen, say what you want about me, my channel, my content, but uh, you'll find me dead before this channel turns into a CinemaSins-style bullshit channel. Originally, what I wrote in the script here is uh, that like there are so many channels like that that bother me. But then last night, uh, I was gonna show Sonia something from uh, CinemaSins, and I actually watched like a minute of a CinemaSins video, and I regretted uh, not going at it harder in my script. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go off script and 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 just say fuck CinemaSins <laughs> because what the fuck is that? It's the it's the absolute it's the worst channel on YouTube. It's terrible. And if you like it, you have bad taste. <laughs> you yeah, you if you like it, you need to stop uh, watching. You need to click off this video. Right, now, please. Uh, stop the video and 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 do, do do something else. Also, to be clear, I'm sitting here with about 3000 subscribers and sub 1000 views, so I'm kicking up here. This is so I can say that. I'm kicking up. So, I know my place. No, but I'm not gonna redo that whole part. Point is, I don't want to do that on this channel. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there are some valuable points that you can raise when analyzing or even overanalyzing the universe of the Toy Story franchise. Because another thing is all of these close calls, where the gang is like just about to be caught and they ragdoll onto the ground, just as an adult comes into the room and says like, ah, oh, how did these get here? Or oh, I thought I told them to pick these up. Like, this is just one group of toys, and they have all these close calls seemingly 
all the time, yet we are to believe that like most toys on the planet uh, are alive and that these fucking idiots have been able to keep this a secret for what, like millions of years? Anyway, that's what I wanted to bring up in this little intermission. So going forward, I might raise some points that one could argue fits into that category of critique, but hopefully you can now relax knowing that I probably have a point other than like just <laughs> Or this whole segment is sort of just like a self-aware safety net. Uh, you know, the whole thing of like, oh, I said it myself before anyone else even had the opportunity to, so I win. Who knows? I do, it's that. Either way, thank you for sticking with me this far through this long ass video and thank you for sticking with me through the intermission and welcome back if you actually used the intermission to take a break, like I said. Before we get back to the main content and talking about Toy Story 4, uh, there is something I need to show you and that is a deleted scene from Toy Story 1. It was only available on like one specific VHS release of the film and I think that the contents of it are gonna be quite important for the analysis I'm gonna be making later. So I'm just gonna play you that scene in full uh, so that you have that with you as we move forward. So here's that. Thank you. Buzz Lightyear the toy space toy man. Buzz the spaceman toy. What if I? A toy man in space. Maybe in space Buzz. Buzz. Oh my god. Buzz. Woody. You're never going to believe it. Woody. What's going on? Spaceman Buzz. Is there a toy in danger that we need to save? No, no, no. Buzz. My friend from space. It's not that. All the toys are safe from dangers, Buzz. It's something much worse, Buzz. It's a lot worse, Buzz. Space, Buzz. Oh my God, Buzz. Oh, Buzz. You're not Why? making this any sense. What is bad, Buzz? God help us, Buzz. God help us. What is it? Lord have mercy, space. What is going on, Kabu Woody? It's. Have you ever heard of YouTube Funny Man Jeff? Of course I have, Woody Man. I love his video. I watched and loved his video about the Wikipedia website. Very good. Made me die laughing. And I hardly black Woody. He's on YouTube making video and watching you watch the videos, my friend Space Toy Buzz. It's about Mustache Man Jeff Jeffy, YouTube guy, Buzz. And it's not good, it's real bad. I'm telling you, partner, it's real bad. Well, what is this in Cover Toys? Step the mush mob, spit it out, Woody. Well, it's over there. This Patreon number, Space Buzz. They are looking real bad, I'm telling you. He's barely able to pay the rent, Buzzman. He spends too much time making videos because that is all he really wants to do. But it's starting to get unrealistic because he isn't quite able to pay his human big man bills, Buzz. Well, welcome. I don't feel so good. Welcome. I think I'm having a fucking panic attack, Woody. If only there was something we could do. <laughs> Welcome back to Toy Story 4 Really Fucking Bothers Me. I hope you had a good intermission. For this one, I'll be dropping the formatting of the previous recaps. It'll be a bit more uh, freeform. It might pop a bit back and forth between the story and my thoughts will be interspersed throughout instead of leaving them all for the ending. I just think that makes sense. This is kind of why uh, we're doing this in the first place. So let's begin. The film starts off with a bit of a retcon, or at least a look back to a scene from the past that we didn't get to see when it happened. And those are always great, have never been received poorly in any other franchise, so at least we're starting off strong here. This scene takes place in between Toy Story 2 and 3, and it starts by introducing us to a version of Bo Peep that we previously haven't gotten to meet. Here we learn that Bo Peep is a confident, self-assured, decision-making girl boss who, alongside with Woody and Buzz, takes charge in situations of crisis. Following this, Bo Peep is put in a box to be donated away. Woody attempts to rescue her, but she lets Woody know that she's accepted this as part of the toy experience. She instead asks Woody to come with her, but Woody, being the person that he is, cannot abandon Andy and stays as she disappears. Now about Bo Peep's entire personality change here, uh, I just wanna say that promoting her character from being just Woody's love interest and a damsel in distress in Andy's play sessions is in and of itself a good thing. This franchise has historically been, to quote myself from the introductory segment of this video, pretty dude-focused, and it makes sense that the time has come to shine a spotlight towards a strong female character. I mean, Jesus Christ, seeing how he's gone from a bachelor to married with three kids, Mr. Potato Head has had more of a character arc than Bo Peep at this point. 
What does bother me a little bit, however, is how they went about it. So it makes sense that Bo Peep has been fleshed out as a character and that the relationship between her and Woody will be more front and center, focusing less on the relationship between Woody and Buzz and more on the two of them. I think that they wanted Bo Peep to have more of an almost main character type role in this one. And if you allow me to get all film school major here for just a little bit, what constitutes a good main character? I'll answer that question because you can't. Well, it's not exclusive to main characters, but it is essential for a main character to have growth. A good example of this is something that I heard like 15 years ago at this point, uh, but that I still think about every now and then. In The Shawshank Redemption, we are following the story of Andy Dufresne and his stay at the prison. He makes friends with Morgan Freeman's character, that I don't remember the name of right now, and spoiler alert, at the end of the film, Andy has escaped and Freeman, as his name implies, has been set free. But Freeman is lost. He's institutionalized and he doesn't know what to do. Eventually though he challenges himself and seeks out Andy in Seo Nateneho. And they meet there, roll credits. Also if any of that was kind of incorrect just roll with it my point will still stand. I haven't seen the Shawshank Redemption in a long time. So when looking back at the Shawshank Redemption, most people tend to say that it's a movie about Andy Dufresne. However from a narrative standpoint Andy really isn't the protagonist of this film, is he? Because as far as character development goes, Andy is pretty much at a standstill throughout the entire thing. He walks around with a mischievous smile from the first time that we see him all the way up until so the And it is through Morgan Freeman's voiceover that we get to follow his story while seeing how Morgan Freeman's character develops from who he is at the beginning of the film to who he is at the end of the film. So keeping that in mind and going back to Toy Story 4, wouldn't it make more sense and also do the continuity between the films a huge favor if we, the audience, got to see Bo Peep grow? And one might argue that, well, she isn't meant to be the main character, that's still Woody. And sure, but arguably Buzz wasn't the main character in Toy Story 1 either, yet he managed to have a very compelling character arc nonetheless. Also, like I said before, growth isn't exclusive to main characters, it's just very essential to them. And even still, if we really don't want her to take up too much time as a developing character throughout the film, which is weird, then why do that in the first place, but if so, how about having her act like we know her from the first films, which admittedly isn't much at all, but perhaps that's exactly why she could be presented as like feeling held back or overlooked. Perhaps during this dramatic rescue mission intro scene, uh, she attempts to help out, but quickly gets stampeded by Woody and Buzz and pushed off to the sidelines. And instead of then having the film focus on Buzz and Woody's rescue mission, that just kind of keeps happening over there, literally and figuratively out of focus while the camera lingers on Bo Peep, allowing us to feel her emotions and realize that, huh, now that I think about it, I don't know if I really know that much about Bo Peep. And then after this, as Bo gets put in the box and taken outside, maybe we could see her almost fall back into her usual pattern of essentially doing what she thinks that she should be doing, i.e. what Woody and the others expect from her, as she begins to try to figure out a way to get out of the box and return back so she can be with Andy's sister or Woody or whatever her main character motivation may be. But then she stops, because what is her main motivation? What does she want? Does she even want to go back? And for the first time we get to witness Bo Peep make a decision for herself. She wants to leave. She doesn't know where, she doesn't know what lies ahead, but she knows that this, whatever it is, isn't for her. At least not anymore. But that's not what happens. Instead we just have Bo Peep being uh, a completely different character from the start of this film and we're meant to just be like, okay, this is how she is now. And that's what some would call, and by some I mean me, a missed opportunity. Okay, we're only a couple of minutes into the film and I'm already getting stuck on like this little uh, detail in the beginning with Bo Peep, but that's because I think that this is part of like the core problem of Toy Story 4 for me, confusion. Toy Story 4 feels confused and it also is confusing. Not plot wise, the plot is pretty easy to follow, but it's a confusion as to why. Why do the characters act like they do? Why do they make the choices that they do? It's a confusion as to what, like what are they trying to say with this film and what are we meant to take away? But 
I think that'll be more apparent the longer we go on, so let's continue. Nine years later, so in the present day of the film, Woody is, surprise surprise, struggling with the fact that Bonnie doesn't play with him enough. Her favorite is, instead, Dolly. Woody has problems adapting to not being the favorite and the leader of the pack, and maybe this is just a biased opinion because I have a problem with this movie in general, but I feel like this worked once, twice, and even thrice, but a fourth time of Woody going, oh no, I, I, I'm uncomfort when we are not about me. What will happen if I don't, uh, the kid not favorite? It just makes me think that, well, I guess Woody learned fucking nothing in those other films after all. It just kind of takes away from the other films, in my opinion. Anyway, Woody sneaks into Bonnie's backpack to come with her to daycare, and at daycare, Bonnie creates Forky. Forky is a goofy little guy that I have no problem with. For some, he is probably the Jar Jar Binks of this universe, but for me, he's fine. He's even funny at times. In fact, let me say this real quick. For all the problems that I have with this movie, the comedy is generally pretty good. I think it's even better than 3. Like, I laughed more while watching this one. And the animation is fucking crazy. I think that the art style is pushing it a little bit for me. I don't know if I feel that this level of like photorealistic detail uh, does this specific universe any huge favors, but just the level of fidelity, the water simulations, the surfaces and textures and the technical craftsmanship on display here is probably the best I've ever seen an animated movie look. But okay, so Bonnie creates Forky and Forky goes on to have an existential crisis because he perceives himself to be trash. You and me both, buddy. Also, hey, this toy doesn't think that he's a toy. He doesn't want to be a toy. I wonder if he'll learn by the end of the film that he is a toy. Back home, Woody introduces Forky to everyone else, and then he becomes kind of a caretaker for Forky. Forky is now Bonnie's new favorite toy, uh, and as opposed to earlier in the film when Woody was struggling, here is actually a pretty good character development moment. Woody sees this as being his job for now. Bonnie loves Forky and it's up to Woody to make sure that Forky doesn't disappear from her, uh, essentially putting Bonnie's interest before his own, which, you know, that's good. It's just weird that he was just struggling with this and now he's already like very stoic about it. Like it does make sense seeing what he went through in the previous films, it's just continuity within this film, that's weird. Now Bonnie is going on a road trip with her parents in their RV and brings her toys. Somewhere along the way, Forky jumps out of the car and so does Woody to save Forky and they must now walk to catch up with the others. As they're walking together, they start talking to each other and after a while, Woody manages to convince Forky that he belongs with Bonnie as a toy. Who would have thunk? It's a really good scene that really stuck with me. It has a lot of like parental implications this movie does in general, which is a whole aspect of this movie that I'm not gonna be exploring in this video because it's just too much. But yeah, there's definitely a theme of like having a kid or wanting to uh, not have a kid and then people go like, oh, but you're gonna understand once you have a kid. <laughs> Everyone wants a kid eventually. And, and yeah, there, that's, that's, that's a whole can of worms that I'll let some other uh, talkative video essay type person on YouTube uh, explore further. Eventually the two of them walk past an antique store and Woody sees the lamp that Bo Peep is part of. That's a weird sentence, but hopefully you, you understand what I mean. Bo Peep is originally like a lamp ornament and not actually a toy and she goes together with the sheep on the... Okay. They go inside hoping to meet Bo, but instead they run into Gabby Gabby and her goons. Gabby Gabby has a broken voice box, so she wants Woody's voice box. Woody, however, manages to escape, but Forky does not. We'll be getting back to Gabby Gabby in a little bit, but for now let's just continue the story. Uh, Woody finds Bo Peep at a playground and she now lives the life of a lost toy, essentially being a kind of badass Mad Max female protagonist type of person. She is free from owners and just roams the earth freely, the world being her oyster. She and her new friends agree to help Woody rescue Forky. Meanwhile, Buzz tries to find Woody, ends up at a carnival, gets joined by some new characters and eventually make it to the antique store. Woody insults Bo Peep by saying some shit about how lost toys can never understand loyalty and Bo Peep uh, understandably leaves. Woody is left to rescue Sporky alone and he goes to confront Gabby Gabby. As he does, he gets to know her backstory. The lady that owns the antique store has a granddaughter who frequently roams around in the shop. Gabby Gabby only wants to be loved by that kid, but she can't because she is broken. That's why she wants Woody's voice box, so that the child can see her as not a broken toy, but a fully functional, lovable toy. 
and take her home. Woody, himself valuing the love from Andy and later Bonnie very highly as we know, feels empathy towards Gabby Gabby and decides to let her have his voice box, on the condition that Forky is released. This all works out, but just as Woody and Sporky are leaving, they see Gabby Gabby being found by the granddaughter. Now, with her brand new voice box installed and she gets rejected again. It's almost like, and bear with me here, it's almost like as if the movie is trying to teach us a valuable lesson here. You are not broken. You don't need to be fixed to be loved. If someone doesn't love you or rejects you because of a personal flaw, especially a physical one, that is on them. You do not need to change. You just need to find someone who is ready to love you like you are. Someone who appreciates the things about you that makes you, you. Defeated, Gabby lays in a box. Woody, however, convinces her to come with them. Bo Peep and the other new characters are back now and together they escape to the carnival from before. Suddenly, Gabby Gabby stops. She has noticed a lost child. She still longs to be loved by a child, just like this one. The others see this and she ends up being placed in a convenient spot for the kid to find her. And here's the real kicker. Remember a minute ago that valuable lesson we talked about, about being loved for who you are and all that nonsense? Well, as it turns out, that was all just fucking bullshit. That was just me making assumptions on what the movie was trying to say, because not only does Gabby Gabby still feel like the road to self-realization is through someone else's validation, the way she goes about to get that someone else's attention is by using her now repaired voice box, really hammering home the point that if Gabby Gabby hadn't gotten her fucked up, broken, worthless piece of shit self fixed, she obviously wouldn't have been able to be loved in the way that she can be loved. Now, the little girl picks up the previously unlovable and disgusting Gabby Gabby, now glowing with happiness from the validation that she is, in fact, finally lovable, and together they walk their unhealthy relationship away from the rest of the gang. Now that's one way to make the message of the movie really strange, but we're not done. So the gang prepares to leave to catch up with Bonnie's RV, and suddenly Buzz steps up to Woody in what might be like the one scene in this entire film where this dynamic duo that millions of kids grew up watching go from complete strangers, even enemies, to best friends. And he informs Woody that Bonnie doesn't need him anymore. And what does Woody do? Woody takes this to heart and decides to stay with Bo Peep, abandoning Bonnie, his friends, and his one most core personality trait behind. Then there's a quick goodbye where Buzz and Woody like hardly interact, and then it's over. See you never, peace out. And that's it. There's a couple of like credit scenes and we see what Bo Peep and Woody are up to, but yeah, that's pretty much it. We're done here. That's Toy Story 4. So now I've tasked myself with finally getting to the point of answering why Toy Story 4 really fucking bothers me. I'd hope that I don't really have to go into that much detail now because I've attempted to make it pretty clear while recapping it. Uh, but to summarize it, I'll start by saying that I had a bit of a realization while writing this. The third act of Toy Story 4 really fucking bothers me. Don't get me wrong, the whole film is unnecessary. They could have just as well not made it. But that being said, it's not a terrible movie for most of it. Like most of the movie is fine, even good at times, but somehow while transitioning from the second to third act, something happens. I don't know what, and the whole film just basically shits itself on the spot. Like for one thing, Woody's character arc doesn't really work for me. It feels strange and forced that he just suddenly decides to essentially give up on everything and leave. One could argue that this is the natural conclusion to his arc, and I could see that being true, like if I squint really hard, but even so, the conclusion isn't necessarily the problem, it's how they get to that conclusion and how believable that is, which, which is not very much. As Woody departs from the group, I almost take it personally when the film decides that Woody and Buzz's goodbye doesn't need to take up more than like a couple of seconds and it's like, well, okay, see ya dude. After the whole film not kind of focusing on them at all, I think that they could at least have had that scene together. 
in Toy Story 3, we have a more heartfelt goodbye between all these characters when Woody still thinks that he's going off to college, something that ends up not even happening. And in this movie, we have a more definitive goodbye, yet it is still so much weaker. Also, I said definitive in quotation marks there because it's probably not super definitive as Toy Story 5 has now been announced not so long ago, so who knows. And while I'm on the topic of Toy Story 5, once it's out, I'll make some kind of video about it, probably not in the style of this one, but I'll do something like reacting or talking a little bit about it, but that'll be probably posted on my second channel, Extra Jeff. I post stuff on Extra Jeff like every week. It's a little bit of everything and uh, I don't know, if you're out there longing for more of me, you should go there and subscribe. Extra Jeff, I'll put it in the card in the corner and probably in the description if I remember to do that. But back to Toy Story 4. It's baffling to me that it really feels like the film is trying to hammer home how none of the characters have learned seemingly anything from the previous films. Especially since I feel like the core idea of this film is to show how much growth and change that all the characters have gone through over the years. That this is like the end of the line, you know? It's also baffling that they, for some reason, chose to avoid doing what I have to imagine would be the easiest thing of all to ensure that this film was received a bit more positively, play on our nostalgic emotions. Make us quirky millennials all teary-eyed, remind us of why we love this franchise so much in the first place, tug on our fucking heartstrings, your goddamn Pixar! I mean, this is what you fucking do! Fucking Finding Dory had me teary-eyed after like 10 minutes. But the entirety of the fourth installment in what is the best Pixar franchise out there, with me watching it, a fucking emotionally vulnerable late 20s, it's cool when men cry kinda wimp, and yet you didn't make me feel anything but like, annoyance? I don't know how that's possible. Anyway, to give a bit more of a summary, I'm gonna quickly just rattle off some of my main problems here. Number one. Bo Peep's character has just changed, rather than evolved. The fact that she is different, she is now cool and she takes up more space is not a problem. It's how they just kind of retconned it uh, into her being this totally new person. Number two, Buzz and Woody's absent relationship. The movie doesn't have to focus on the two of them, we already have three of those films. But it feels like Buzz is like barely there. And furthermore, I feel like when Buzz and Woody do interact with each other, it's like stiff and weird. It's as if they were like acquaintances rather than, you know, you've got a friend in me and all that. Three, Woody's unclear motivations and reasons for doing what he does throughout the entire film and the forced character development that he supposedly goes through in this movie. Four, Gabby Gabby and the wildly strange message of her storyline and character arc. And finally, number five, and I'm gonna have to go into detail on this one a bit more, the way that they expand the universe to reveal extremely unpleasant details about the reality of toys. Essentially, Toy Story 4 expands the Toy Story universe in ways that make it impossible to deny how absolute fucking Franz Kafka this entire universe is. The biggest achievement for this film, as far as I'm concerned, is how well it manages to convince me of the fact that a toy's life is essentially nothing more than a never-ending nightmare of getting outgrown by the one person that you treasure the most over and over again. Being forgotten, lost, abandoned, seeing your own self-worth, goals and ambitions crumble before your very eyes and the options that you have to like deal with this or either abandon that which you deem the most important, throw yourself into the vast unknown with no motivations for anything. And also this option isn't really viable because it isn't an option for all toys. Like I don't think I have to explain to you that if all toys did this, like just pieced out to roam freely, we would see toys everywhere. So I guess this solution is just like for a select few. It's just not a catch-all solution for the problematic implications that the film manages to create. The other option that the toys have is to take the route that the main gang, Sans Woody, takes at the end of Toy Story 4, going back to Bonnie and thereby essentially denying the reality of the situation that they're in. Don't think about the inevitable suffering that lays ahead when Bonnie outgrows you and does what Emily did to Jesse or what Andy did to Woody or what Lotso's owner did to Lotso or what Andy did to Weezy. Those are problems for future you. Right now, you're just gonna try to enjoy the tiny sliver of time you have with this child and 
hopefully somehow this torturous existence will somehow work itself out before you inevitably get abandoned by them. At the end of Toy Story 3, we were left with what was essentially the exact opposite feeling of this. Things will work out. They will stay with Bonnie for as long as she needs them, and after that the future is uncertain, but maybe they'll find another kid that needs them, and if they were to not do that, there's always Sunnyside as a backup option, where they can go if they want to. We have all worked through our insecurities and fears, and we know that as long as we have each other, things will, in one way or another, work out in the end. But then along comes Toy Story 4, and psych, fuck all that bullshit. Just like the prospector said, we will all rot and die in a landfill, be left on a shelf or incinerate at the literal gates of hell. Friendship is meaningless when put against the reality of eternal suffering, and we are freaks of nature, condemned to eternally walk this earth with nothing to motivate each stumbling step that we take. We are unnatural, faulty, broken by design. We are all broken, broken. Nothing can stop time from passing. Remember that one? scene in Toy Story 3 where Woody calls the dog expecting it to come running into the room like in Toy Story 2 to go on like a fun rescue mission but instead of an excited puppy an old tired dog enters the room because Woody doesn't age and he forgets that while other beings bear the curse of mortality he bears the arguably worse curse of having to see their mortality play out in front of his very eyes again and again and god if if we were to not end up in a landfill, if we were to stick around on a shelf or in a box, we're gonna have to watch every single non-toy that we love embrace the sweet kiss of death, one by one in front of our very eyes, while we are frozen in time, unaffected in every way except for our emotionally rich inside lives. If there is a God, I curse his name. I curse God for creating me, only for me to suffer. I curse God. Existence is hell. Existence is hell. Kill me. Kill me. End me. Kill me. Thank you so much for watching through that entire thing. I can't believe you pulled through and, and actually uh, did it. You've reached the end of the video. This is the outro segment. You can skip this if you want to, but you can also stick around. It might be fun. I'm going to have my patron producers and then the rest of my patrons roll down the screen as I talk here. And uh, before I leave you for the day, I'm going to do one last little thing for this video. And mostly I'm going to be doing this because the thought of how slowly the patron names will have to roll to fill up this entire time of me talking is very funny to me. But uh, what I wanted to do is to tell you how I would have changed the ending to Toy Story 4 if I had the opportunity to do so, to kind of fix it, I guess. So in this scenario, uh, most of the movie is set in stone and I can't like cancel it or change the setup or anything. Basically, uh, I'm being called in as a script doctor for some reason, and they ask me to change the ending of the film. Maybe some other like small details, but yeah, it's mostly fix it up, not rewrite it. So here are my suggestions. Uh, let's start with the most obvious, Gabby Gabby. So after Gabby Gabby has been rejected, uh, she and Woody has a little dialogue where she uh, apologizes to Woody for taking his voice box, and uh, she demands that they switch back. Woody, however, insists, no, 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 you, you keep it. Um, but she says that she doesn't want to keep it. It's not me, she says. They smile at each other and they share a moment of seeing themselves in the other. When Gabby Gabby later sees the lost child, she stops. Does she want this? Could she even handle another rejection? Woody sees the longing in her eyes and he walks up to her and says something along the lines of, Hey, Gabby, you can stay with us if you want. But if you truly want to go to her, do it. If it doesn't work, you'll always have us. The rest of the toys nod in agreement and smile. Gabby Gabby looks at them and then looks down at the crying kid and has a realization. She must go there. But she mustn't go there for herself. She must go there to be there for the kid. So she goes there, sits down on the ground and pulls on her voice box string. And this needs to be established earlier in the film but I'm thinking that her voice box kind of skips. Uh, that's how it's broken. So she sits down on the ground, pulls on her string, and it goes, I'm G Gabby Gabby, and I love you. The crying kid turns her head towards her, walks up to her, lifts her up, and says, Are you lost 
too. I can't fi find my p p p parents. She pulls Gabby's string. You'll always ha have m me. I l l love you. All the other toys watch in suspense. The girl hugs Gabby Gabby and walks off with her. All the toys cheer. See what I did there? The child has a stuttering problem, meaning that Gabby Gabby is actually perfect just the way she is for this specific child. Moving on. At the very end, as Woody is about to say goodbye, he does it to everyone, but then he stops at Buzz. They look at each other for a few seconds, none of them sure of what to say. Buzz then breaks the silence. I'm proud of you, cowboy. Only you know what's best. Woody looks at him and hesitates. He seems to be doubting himself. He looks back at Bo Peep and then turns to Buzz again and says, Um, hold on a second, and then runs over to Bo Peep. We see him talking to her from Buzz's perspective. We don't know what's being said. As Woody comes back, Buzz now expects that Woody will have changed his mind and wants to stay with the other toys and Bonnie. Woody puts his hands on Buzz's shoulders and says, Thanks for everything, Buzz. He pulls him in for a hug. Buzz looks startled for a second, then disappointed, but his face then softens as he remembers that this is for Woody. If he wants to leave, that's what he should do. And he hugs him back. As they pull away from the embrace, Woody's hand rests on Buzz's shoulders, and Woody says, And if you ever need me, I won't be far. With a little wink. Buzz looks puzzled, but then gives Woody a little nod, and Woody walks off with Bo Peep, the rest of the toys going the other direction. And then the movie essentially ends there, but we still have the credit scenes. And instead of seeing the one that we do see of Bo Peep and Woody kind of being at the carnival with other toys, we instead see this. The RV is parked at a little lake. Bonnie's mom is barbecuing and Bonnie's dad is setting the table. Kinda tucked behind the RV is a picnic blanket on which Bonnie sits playing with her toys. There's some trees surrounding her. She's kind of in a glade, I think that's what it's called. You know, it's just a few trees, it's not a full forest, that kind of thing. She's in the middle of a play session, holding all the toys in her hand. We see it in close-ups like when Andy is playing with the toys in the beginning of Toy Story 1. And her play session is just getting into the most dramatic scene. Rex, Slinky Dog, Bus, everyone is tied up and captured by the evil Mr. Potato Head and all that stuff. And Bonnie goes in the voice of Buzz. Oh no, what are we going to do? Who is going to save us? And just as she says that, she hears a familiar voice. Reach for, for the, the sky. sky. Bonnie's immersion breaks. She slowly looks up, and on a tree stump a few meters away, lays Woody. Woody! Bonnie exclaims and runs to pick him up. She holds him in her hand, surprised for a second, but then quickly and excitedly gets back to her play session. She puts Woody on bullseye and pretends that Woody is riding all the way from the forest to the others to save them. He's riding as fast as he can, but when she gets back to the blanket, all the toys are already freed from their ropes. The ropes are instead tied around Mr. Potato Head and next to him stands Bo Peep. Bonnie stops again before a huge smile slowly spreads across her face. It's the Princess Astronaut Supergirl here to rescue the day and blah blah blah. She starts playing with them, incorporating Bo Peep in the play. And we get a fleeting moment during this play session, a close-up where Woody and Bo Peep locks eyes and smile. Woody then looks over at Buzz and the others. Buzz does a subtle thumbs up. Bonnie then gets interrupted by her mother calling for her. Bonnie, dinner! She turns around. Coming! She starts running away, but then stops and turns to grab Woody and Bo Peep, but they're gone again. She looks confused for a second before she hears from somewhere she can't pinpoint. You're, You're my favorite, favorite deputy. deputy! She looks around but can't see him anywhere. Bonnie, come on! She smiles and then turns and runs away again. Coming! Mom, I gotta tell you, Woody came back and he had a super cool friend. She's a space ranger just like Buzz and Her voice fades away as she's describing Bo Peep to her mom. In a nearby bush, we see Woody looking out through the leaves before turning back to Bo Peep. They have extended her skunk car to now have a little trailer, and he sits down next to her outside it as the camera slowly pulls away, implying that Woody might have left the gang, but he'll be around every now and then, and if they ever need him, both Bonnie and the rest of the group knows that no matter what, we'll always have each other for infinity and beyond. Thank you for watching.